Today he's going to talk about the families. He's going to talk about all those uh, connections that Andrew Jackson had to the people that made all the money off the removal. I'll tell you what he's going to talk about. <laughs> See if I can get this thing a test here. Can y'all hear me back there in the back? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, before I start, I need to say thanks to some people. Uh, first of all, when we did this about a decade ago, a similar thing to this, uh, before this organization, uh, I presented information that had been generated by Amanda Page and Fuller Bumpers, who were interns with me and, and in my own research. And uh, some of that is still in this presentation. And then uh, Tony Rose, who is a uh, former assistant director of the center, uh, contributed to it. So I'm not the only scholar whose uh, work uh, this represents. So I just want to say that to them uh, in, in their behalf. Also, I would say that uh, if any of you, there's a book in this somewhere, I'm trying to get out. Um, if anybody's interested in that, we can tell you where the bodies are buried. And we would be happy to help you do the research on that topic. Because the economics of removal, uh, I think, is something that really needs to be looked at in detail. And Last time we, we said if we had a thesis it would be that uh, in the early stages of, of removal from the east to the west, uh, there was an opportunity to make money. In the last stages of removal, that is west of the Mississippi, there was an opportunity for fraud and graft. Uh, anybody who was interested in making money at that time zeroed in on the state of Arkansas really fast because all they had to do was to look at the maps and see that all of these tribes were going to come through this state and that state and <coughs> would be uh, provide opportunities for people to make money and they did. They made lots of money and so that's what some of this today talks about. Now when we did that presentation some years ago we had only this one major episode that we gave and since then, we've developed four more episodes, and of course we won't get to those today. Uh, but uh, I do want to talk about an earlier episode than the one we presented last time, um, because it didn't just happen that all these people came together at removal uh, time to take advantage of the money-making opportunity and uh, to get more money out of it than they really should have. Uh, the groundwork was laid for that uh, generation before, and so I want to begin by talking about uh, some of those connections that uh, I think help provide the people that came in in the next generation and we're on the ground in removal, and there's where the graft and fraud really took place. So let me begin with the Treaty of Dogue Stand in 1820. Henry Jackson, as you know, was one of the major uh, uh, negotiators at that point. But he had with him, uh, in that, a friend of his, Thomas Hine, uh, who had served under him at the Battle of New Orleans. And he was, Jackson was really loyal to those people that fought with him. And they provide uh, many of these people that are later involved in the uh, removal process. Now, Hines would later be a congressman from Georgia uh, after his service with Jackson. And he married Lamine de, oh, I can't say that one's name, Lamine de Green. And she was the daughter of Thomas Green, a one-time delegate to the U.S. Congress from Mississippi Territory. Uh, Jackson and Rachel Dawson had been married at the Green Plantation. And so that was his connection with uh, uh, Hines at, on a personal level. Uh, Thomas Hines' brother, Abraham, was married to Elizabeth Caffey, who was Rachel's niece. 
So he had family connections to that uh, family. Now, I'm going to have to read some of this, folks, because if I don't, it's going to end up sounding like the gas in the body. Uh, and, and I never was able to memorize those. Uh, some people may be able to, but uh, if I don't stick to this text, I'm not going to get through what I want to get through today, which is two, two uh, episodes of this. Now, as Peter Franklin, which I talked about a little bit yesterday, uh, you know there his commissioners were John Eaton, Secretary of War at that time, his first one. And he was married uh, to the ward of uh, Andrew Jackson. And then John Coffey, uh, he and Jackson had been involved as business partners uh, in not only land speculation, but merchandising. He had fought with Jackson in the war. And then, uh, uh, of 1812, and then of course you met, and then uh, he uh, was married to uh, Rachel Donaldson's niece. Now, after the war of 1812, Coffee took up land survey. And there's, a, there's another episode out there that needs to be written about the role of surveyors and removal. What we find is that many of these people who had major administrative jobs in removal were also land surveyors. And as you know, land surveying and land speculation <coughs> hand in hand from the beginning of the nation with George Washington, who was a surveyor and then was deeply involved in land speculation later. Uh, and so keep that in mind because many of these people who end up making money in removal were also land surveyors. And I'm going to get off on a tangent and I'll have to do that. That's the problem with this. It's like chewing a steak. Um, now, Coffee, as you know, laid out Florence. Now, Alabama, that area, he surveyed that and laid it out. He knew, of course, a place at the foot of the shoals was going to be important in transportation. And so this was what the surveyors did. They located the best possible, possible sites for money making as well as the best arable land in the areas that they served because land was graded at that time according to how good it was for agricultural purposes. So, uh, and then he also surveyed the boundary between Alabama and Mississippi. Now, as I said, uh, John Eaton was married to Myra Lewis, who was a uh, ward of Andrew Jackson. She was the daughter of William Carroll Lewis, Jr., uh, who had been uh, one of Tennessee's largest landholders until his death when he put his daughters, both daughters, into Andrew Jackson's care. Um, Margaret Lewis uh, married one of Jackson's longtime aides, William Berkeley Lewis, uh, who had been his quartermaster for a number of years. His reward for his years of service and loyalty to Andrew Jackson was that he became the second auditor of the treasury. And those of you who have done any basic research in Indian removal know that the records of the second auditor are records that are key to our knowing the details of removal on a day-to-day -day basis. And he will become important later because the Treasury Department pays out money to certain people who probably didn't deserve it. But you have to remember that this guy was the second auditor uh, all the way through removal period and for many years after that. Now, after Margaret's death, William Lewis married Adelaide Stokes. She was the daughter of Montford Stokes. U.S. Senator Governor of North Carolina, he resigned his governorship to become an Indian commissioner appointed by Andrew Jackson to further the business of 
uh, ended in movement. He came out to Fort Pearson and set up shop there and negotiated with a large number of tribes uh, who had land claims east of the Mississippi. Some of them had already moved to the west. And so if you look at the uh, 70 removal trees, flush removal trees that were uh, done under the Indian Removal Act of 1830, you'll see many of those are dated at Fort Gibson because of Monker Stokes. And then once he, that commission expired, he became the agent for the Cherokees. So he's on the ground, uh, you know, in the middle of removal. Now there are other high level connections. The Chickasaw agent, G.P. Kingsbury, was the son-in-law of Henry Dodge, who was the territorial governor of Wisconsin. Dodge's half-brother, Louis F. Lynn, was U.S. Senator from Missouri. Removal agent John T. Fulton was the son of Little Rock Mayor at the time of removal, David Fulton, and his brother, uh, and was brother to William S. Fulton, Arkansas territorial judge, territorial governor, and U.S. senator during this removal period. William S. had served as Jackson's personal secretary from 1815 to 1820. So the Fultons, who are involved, and particularly Choctaw removal and some of the others, are, have a direct connection to Andrew Jackson. Lieutenant Edward Dees was the grandson of Ralph Hizzard, delegate to the Continental Congress and U.S. Senator from South Carolina. Dees was the nephew of George Hizzard, the territorial governor of Arkansas in the 1820s. Then there were the Johnsons, who were among the wealthiest and the most influential families in the South in the years leading up to the Civil War. Vice President Richard M. Johnson had been a congressman from Kentucky. He'd been a U.S. Senator and was Vice President of the U.S. from 1837 to 1841. He had two brothers who had been in the Congress as well. Now his oldest brother, Benjamin, was appointed territorial judge for Arkansas by President Monroe in 1821 and held that position until he was appointed by Jackson as the first federal judge for the state of Arkansas in 1836. And he was one of the founders of the Arkansas family. Now we haven't written that chapter yet, but in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, the Johnson, Conway, and Rector families were referred to in local politics as the family. Now, when we did this uh, back, all in the family, we called it, uh, people thought it was a takeoff on that sitcom from a few decades ago. But it wasn't. It was a pun on the family who ran Arkansas politics and got their start in the removal period, making all that money and making cold politics until uh, the Civil War. Now, there'll be more about Johnson later. Francis W. Armstrong and William Armstrong were brothers, both serving as superintendent of Indian Affairs for the Western District. Francis married Anne Millard. Anne's brother, John M. Millard, was removal agent for the Choctaws and Chickasaws. Anne and John's sister, Rebecca, married Forbes Britton. Britton was stationed at Fort Gibson and Fort Coffee and later served in Florida, 1838-1842, and attended Seminole removal parties to the West. When Francis Armstrong died, his widow Anne married Richard Barnes Mason, commander at Fort Gibson and Fort Towson during the removal period. Robert B. Croc Crockett, removal conductor for the Creek and Chickasaw removal contingents, was brother-in-law to A. A. M. Upshaw, superintendent of Chickasaw removal and later Chickasaw agent. Marcus B. Winchester, the merchant at Mem at, here at Memphis, uh, was the commissary of record during the Chickasaw removal, stored the Chickasaw rations. He ran the ferry, taking removal parties across the Mississippi on their way to Little Rock. He's often called the founder of Memphis. He ran the enterprise that was owned by his father, General James Winchester, and his partners, Andrew Jackson and Judge John Overton of Nashville. And there were other interesting connections that I could keep going at this higher level, but I want to go into all of the family episode two.
give you a little bit of that. And I want to read this to you folks. I hate to do that, but that's the only way I'm going to get this in. Our story begins just after the Chickasaw signed an agreement in Bokesville to settle in the Western District of the Choctaw Nation. The leaders asked that enough ration be acquired to, uh, to accommodate those Chickasaws who were prepared to remove. Instead, in the spring of 1837, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, Kerry A. Harris, ordered the purchase of over one million rations to be charged against the Chick Chickasaw Fund accumulated in the sale of Chickasaw land in Mississippi. These rations were to be distributed at Memphis, Little Rock, and Fort Coffee. Some of the rations were on their way by the time officials in Indian Territory began to even think about warehouses to store it. Now, footnote on Harris. Harris was named Commissioner of Indian Affairs by Andrew Jackson because Harris had been a newspaper man in Franklin, Tennessee, who had been an avid supporter of Jackson when he ran for president. So that was his political plum. And there's a lot more about him later. When the hundreds of tons of stores arrived in Indian Territory, they were stored in what buildings could be found at Fort Coffee, Fort Smith, Pleasant Bluff, and the Choctaw Agency, or sat in the open until accommodations could be built. A little more than 500 chicks were removed in the spring of 1837. The corn and sacks and the pork and flour and barrels sat through a steamy summer. In the fall, the second wave of arriving chicken sauce were issued rations that were unfit to eat. When it became obvious that the chicken sauce were going to suffer a tremendous loss, the local agency, namely RDC Collins, distributing agent for removal of Little Rock, and William Armstrong, superintendent of the Western District of Choctaw Agency, began to give it away. And here is the deal. In December of 1837, they transferred to the Lip Group. Having trouble talking this morning. That must mean I'm ill. <laughs> Somebody usually don't have trouble talking. Lorenzo N. Clark, all of the pork still in storage at Little Rock and Fort Smith. Now, did you hear They gave it to him, okay? Other supplies of corn had gone with the partnership of brothers in law John Brennan and David Thompson and Van Buren. In January of 1838, they transferred all the Chickasaw stores of corn and pork at Fort Coffee to the firm of Glasgow and Harrison at St. Louis. In return for these free stores, which they would sell for what they could get on the open market, the contractors would, upon proper notice, resupply the Chickasaws with fresh rations at supply stations in the Chickasaw district. Differences were to be adjusted. Clark was an agent for Glasgow and Harrison. So in effect, Glasgow and Harrison received a lion's share of Chickasaw ration uh, of all the Chickasaw funds, as well as a lucrative contract to supply Chickasaw with rations for a year after removal. Glasgow and Harrison was a partnership that had been formed to trade and furnish creeks and Seminoles with rations and subsistence for 12 months after 1837. A partner of the firm was James S. Conway, governor of Arkansas and there are some other interesting people who belong to that firm too. <coughs> what happened? Clark defaulted on his contract. The Chickasaw rations disappeared. Drennan and Thompson defaulted on their contract. The Chickasaw rations disappeared. Glasgow and Harrison engaged in a number of practices. During the spring of 1838, they failed to supply the Chickasaws in the Western District for months. This was a starving time for the Chickasaws and desperate need of corn. In the late spring, when the contractors finally delivered corn to the district, the Chickasaws were systematically given short rations. In addition, the company was paid extra for supplying these rations, and that's not all. The free Chickasaw rations that they had received were so bad that much of the stores could not be sold on the open market, so they issued them to the Creeks and Seminoles, and were paid so much per ration for supplying them. When the Cherokee contingents began to arrive in the West in the early months of 1839, Glasgow and Harrison had the contract to supply them. And some of the Chickasaw rations, then two years old, were issued to the Cherokees. And Glasgow and Harrison got paid for those, too. 
Thus, Glasgow and Harrison not only had a monopoly, but they got the Chickasaw rations free, which they issued to other tribes and got paid for doing it. Meanwhile, in the summer of 1838, the disgruntled former employee, Austin J. Raines, had charged the company with fraud and bribery. Commissioner Harris sat on the uh, complaint. He did, didn't send it to the Secretary of War, Joel R. Poinsett, but he showed it to his good friend, James S. Conway, a partner in Glasgow and Harrison. The charges forced Collins and Armstrong to defend the practices of Glasgow and Harrison even more and give them still more contracts, which Commissioner Harris approved. In October 1838, however, Harris came under fire for some of his fiscal policies, which were dealt with in All in the Family, Episode 3, which we won't get to today, probably. And T. Harley Crawford took his place. Crawford began to scrutinize contracts more closely, and rivers began to flow that R.D.C. Collins was in collusion with Glasgow and Harrison. In fact, he was a partner. Uh, at the same time, all of this was going wrong, the Cherokees began to arrive in the West. Immediately, they complained about lack of rations, the quality, and short measures. Now, about the same time, <clears throat> Rain shows up again. He comes and goes in this story. Uh, he claimed to be a trader, uh, trading with the Chihuahua trade and, and in other places in the Southwest. But uh, I'm not sure what he was. But he threatened to go to Congress this time if the War Department didn't act on his complaint. When the War Department decided it couldn't ignore him any longer, Crawford asked William Armstrong, the superintendent of Indian Affairs in the Western District, to investigate the question of fraud and rations. While Armstrong was supposedly doing this, and the story plays out that he didn't do anything except try to cover his tracks, um, Complaints from elsewhere had said that Collins had awarded contracts to Glasgow and Harrison on the promise of re receiving a fifth, <coughs> a part of a sixth of the profits. Now, those rumors are never really proved, but all the evidence is there that, it, that they were true, uh, that those charges were true. On the last day of 1839, Crawford ordered John Pilcher, superintendent of Indian Affairs at St. Louis, to investigate, which he began to do in 1840. Now, meanwhile, when Armstrong informed the parties that he was investigating the matter, Rain suddenly dropped the charges. And not only dropped the charges, but asked that the government go ahead and pay uh, Glasgow and Harrison. And then he left the country. <laughs> In an attempt to cover the matter, Armstrong gave Raines all the papers and letters that he had submitted to take with him. But unfortunately, there, was a, there were copies of them elsewhere, and we have those today. Pilcher, meanwhile, in his investigation, not only exonerated R.D.C. Collins, but praised him as an honest fellow. He's also a drunk. Uh, in Indian Territory, he learned from Armstrong that Glasgow and Harrison had bought Raines Hall. Arnold Harris, Sutler, no kin to the uh, commissioner, Sutler at Fort Gibson had brokered the deal. He had been authorized to offer up to $20,000, but Raines had settled for thirteen. dollars That was a lot of money in that period. Harris, a former soldier known as Williams, who changed his name, stellar character, was married to Armstrong's niece. Pilcher stopped investigating at that point. He took Armstrong's word and he said that Armstrong could tell the government what it needs to know. But it didn't rest there. Accusations continued to circulate, not only that the firm had committed, committed fraud, but that Collins was in collusion with them. In his report in the late spring of 1841, Secretary of War John Bell accused unnamed contractors and others of being involved in fraud. Even though they were not named, James Glasgow responded for the firm. That did not, however, prevent the appointment of Special Investigator Major Ethan Allen Hitchcock. Upon his arrival in Indian Territory in late 1841, Hitchcock soon concluded that fraud had been committed. Everywhere he looked, 
He saw failure on the part of government officials to prevent fraud at all levels. Armstrong, on the other hand, denied all knowledge of any wrongdoing. Of course, he lied. He had no authority to do anything about it if he had, he said, and he lied again. He denied any knowledge of the contracts Collins had made with Glasgow and Harrison. And he lied again because you can look at those contracts today and there's his signature, big as life, on those. So he knew all about them. He knew nothing of short rations or overestimated livestock weights. He lied. Um, everybody knew about them. Uh, and his clerk, Johnson, was one of the issuing agents for Glasgow and Harrison. So his office was deeply involved in that short ration. Then who was to blame if, as he says, he wasn't? Well, possibly the military officials at Fort Gibson who oversaw the rations to the Greek Seminoles and Cherokees. G.P. Kingsbury was the sub-agent for the Chickasaws, but he was dead by that time and couldn't be asked. Um, Rain's complaint? Well, Rains is dead, Armstrong said, and I have no disposition to say anything about the reports he may have made. Collins' crookedness? As he is dead, Armstrong said, it is at least an act of justice to say that no censure is attached to him. And then finally, the biggest lie of all, last one, Harrison, he said, always fulfill your contracts. And the Chickasaws could testify probably to a person about that. Now Hitchcock knew that Armstrong was a liar and was convinced that he was the main player in the fraud ring, which he was. And he found evidence that Armstrong knew about and even laughed at the fraud committed by Simeon Buckner, steamboat owner who had the contract to remove Chickasaws. Hitchcock also knew before he left Indian Territory in early 1842 that his report was not going to be popular in Washington, that he had no idea what was in store for him. Just prior to his return, the House Committee on Public Expenditures had investigated the claims of Buckner, the Louisville steamboat owner, for expenses in the Chickasaw removal. By the way, Buckner was also a partner in Glasgow and Harrison. The congressman challenged his bill for 1,064 tons of baggage. Now, they didn't know that the Chickasaws were not limited to that 30-pound restriction, and that the Chickasaws did bring a great deal of property to the West with them. Uh, but anyway, uh, they focused on that at first. Uh, but what they didn't know about Buckner was that he padded a lot of his reports uh, we have testimony by uh, removal agents, people who were conductors of, of different groups, talking about his attempt to get them drunk and get them to sign certain pieces of paper saying that the tonnage he was carrying or the number of passengers, passengers he was carrying was a lot larger than what he really uh, carried. But what they really looked hard at were his demerits charts. He had a sweet deal uh, that was made with uh, uh, Joseph A. Phillips, who was the dispersing agent for Indian removal here in Memphis, and what he had got in that was not just uh, a monopoly on removing Chickasaws using his steamboats, but he also got $100 a day demerge. Now that meant that if that boat was idle for a day, he got $100. Well, he got six boats to Memphis a month before any Choctaw got here. <laughs> So I'm sure that that was on purpose. But anyway, this is what he put in a claim for. Well, what really astounded the congressman was that almost $38,000 had been paid to Buckner for Chickasaws who did not ride his boat. Buckner openly admitted that only 3,001 Chickasaws, and that may have been too high a figure, rode his boats and he was paid for them shortly after the service. We had evidence that he strong-armed uh, people to pad those records, but what happened was this. When large masses of Chickasaw showed up here in Memphis uh, in the fall of 1837, word came in that the Monmouth had crashed and went into Trenton and 
over 300 Creeks had been killed. And then the Thomas Yateman uh, had had a, uh, an explosion. It had been used in removal. Um, and so a large number of Chickasaws decided they didn't want to ride boats, that, that they would take off through the Mississippi Swamp uh, as the swamp on the west side of the river was called, and would um, go that route. And I'm going to I'm gonna have to stop and do a footnote here to the Yateman. As you know, when John Ross was coming west, he had to park the boat to the Victoria at Cairo and go up uh, to, uh, into Illinois to put down a, the start of a rebellion that they accused James Walker of uh, being behind. As you investigate that story, you find that there were stories circulating that Walford was sort of in the pay of some Tennessee, uh, Nashville, Tennessee uh, merchants, and that they had been trying to get the Cherokee contingents to stop the overland movement at the Mississippi River and take the boats uh, at that point. So, and then these unnamed Nashville merchants show up all the way through the literature on this. Well, my question was, who were those people? Now, Thomas Gateman, his firm had headquarters in Nashville and Memphis. They were steamboaters. Um, it was, and whether they were behind this or had an interest in it, I'm not sure. We have a large cache of the Aitman family papers at the Sequoia Natural Research Center um, uh, that date from 1811 up through Civil War period. Um, but I found no evidence in that. But they were steamboaters. So it would have to be somebody who had an interest in steamboating to get them to get off Cherokees off land and own steamboats. So that's an area that I still have to investigate to see if that's not another episode uh, in this whole mess. Well, well, how did Buckner collect this money? $37,749. The answer lies in the influence of Richard M. Johnson, Vice President of the United States. He and his brothers had extensive plantations uh, with slaves in Chico County, Arkansas. That's Johnson. Johnson needed money. He tried to sell his land to Buckner. Buckner refused, but he said he would do this. If Johnson would help him collect for the Chickasaws that he did not haul, he would loan Johnson $18,000. Johnson personally went around Washington with Buckner urging this claim. They left the War Department with two <coughs> requisitions. Now this is Joel Poinsett, and he still has to be looked at. At the Treasury Department, two checks were written, one to Buckner and one to Johnson. Now remember who was the second auditor in the Treasury Department at this time, in charge of receipts and payments and Indian affairs. It was Lewis. And Buckner gave Johnson an interest-free note. Johnson never paid the money back, but he did give Buckner an undivided half interest in his 400 acres and buildings of the Choctaw Academy at White Silver Springs, Kentucky. The House concluded that it was solely the physical presence of Vice President Johnson that got Buckner paid. So that ties it to the highest level of administration at that point. Now, a month after exposing Buckner and Johnson, the House Committee published its findings on C.A. Harris, which it was who uh, they were investigating. He had resigned on October 19, 1838. Now, it appeared that Harris was involved in buying Choctaw land and uh, uh, pardon me, Chickasaw land in Mississippi. It was reported to the War Department, and it reported it in turn to the President, who asked Harris for an explanation. Harris gave one, but it didn't satisfy the President. So the President asked him for another, and at that point, Harris resigned. 
When the House investigated in the spring of 1842, the correspondence relating to the case had disappeared. It seems that it had been kept separate from the other War Department correspondence as long as Joel Poinsett was secretary. Shortly before he left office, Poinsett had the papers delivered to him and they were never seen again. Now, Joel Poinsett's papers, I think, are at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, somebody might want to look at those to see if he might have kept them. While the congressman could not prove draft without correspondence, they could charge Harris with malfeasance. They cited purchase of removal rations without bids, and he supposedly bought a cargo in New Orleans that they nailed him with. They argued that the Chickasaw Fund had been systematically raided and cited specifically the giveaway of Chickasaw rations to Lorenzo Clark and his partner David Thompson who took the rations but defaulted on their contract. Strangely, they made no mention of the giveaway to Thompson and his brother-in-law, John Drennan. And you know, John Drennan used his influence later to become, replace William Armstrong as the superintendent of Indian Affairs for the Southwest. Now, immediately following the House Committee reports on Buckner and Harris, Hitchcock arrived from Washington, arrived in Washington and filed his report, determined to tell the truth. He exposed the loss resulting from Harris's overpurchase of Chickasaw rations in 1837. He condemned official uh, action regarding Glasgow and Harrison. He came close to calling William Armstrong a liar regarding the role, his roles in the contracts. The House decided to investigate fraud in Cherokee subsistence and asked for Hitchcock's report. Secretary of War John Spencer, who had replaced uh, Poinsett, said not without his heart's blood. Hitchcock was treated like a leper by the War Department and other officials in Washington. Although he waited uh, in Washington, the War Department would not let him go near the House. Of representatives. He wasn't exactly under house arrest, but they kept tabs on him to make sure he didn't talk to those congressmen. The general in the army threatened to send him to Florida to fight the Seminoles. Secretary Spencer recommended to the president that the report not be turned over. Meanwhile, he asked the solicitor of the treasury for an option uh, uh, about considering criminal prosecution. The solicitor agreed that Glasgow and Harrison had issued inferior rations irregularly and fraudulently. But he concluded that prosecution was not practical because many of those involved were dead or gone from the Southwest. And only the case of Lorenzo Clark might be prosecuted, he said. But Clark was small fry in this case. Now, on the side, Secretary Spencer had asked the solicitor in, for a confidential opinion about William Armstrong. And there resulted a concerted effort at that point to protect Armstrong. War Department officials closed ranks. One told Hitchcock twice that to accuse Armstrong publicly would have dire consequences because of the power of the Armstrongs in Tennessee. It might even result in the death of John Bell, who as secretary had appointed Hitchcock special investigator. The president evoked executive privilege and despite repeated requests for the Hitchcock report from Congress, he held it for many years, uh, pardon me, many months. And by the time Congress got the papers, Range was dead, Kingsbury was dead, Collins was dead, Harris was dead, and Armstrong had successfully stonewalled and escaped exposure. Why did Armstrong have such power? He was a conceited authoritarian bureaucrat who rarely traveled outside the Southwest during his tenure in office. He had succeeded his brother Francis as superintendent in 1835. Francis was a West Point graduate who had fought in the War of 1812 and that was his contact with uh, Andrew Jackson. He resigned from the Army in 1817 and went into business in Mobile 
He was elected to the Alabama legislature for a number of terms as both representative and senator. Francis was active in the election of Jackson. Uh, and in 1831, the Secretary of War appointed him to make a census of the Choctaws. And so he makes his entree into Indian affairs at that point. On the day he completed it, he became agent for the Choctaws west of the Mississippi. In 1834, he became superintendent of Indian affairs for the Western District, and he died in 1835, and he was succeeded by his brother. And what was William's background? From 1829 to 32, he was mayor of Nashville. On July 2nd, 1832, he became special agent and superintendent for removal of the Choctaws. In 1835, he, su he succeeded his brother, and there was nothing in his background that could be parlayed into power, at least on the surface. But there was Francis and William's brother, Robert Armstrong. He even fought with Andrew Jackson on a number of occasions. Uh, he commanded a company of Tennessee artillery under Jackson in the Creek War of 1813-14. Jackson considered him a hero at a Muckaw Creek in January of 1814, where he was wounded at Talladega, he was wounded again severely. He nevertheless fought under Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. He received the political patronage of the postmaster at Nashville in 1829 and held it until 1845. Now, obviously, the postmaster of Nashville had been a good and faithful servant of Jackson, but more than that, he was the apple of Andrew's eye. Contemporaries referred to him as the president's pet. He stayed at the Hermitage when Jackson was away. The evidence of Jackson's closeness to Armstrong is the fact that in his will, Jackson bequeathed Robert the box of pistols and sword that he carried throughout his career. So it was not the power of the Armstrong family in Tennessee that the War Department officials appeared in 1842. It was the source of their power, Andrew Jackson. Now, I can give you a little bit of uh, episode three. Somebody, somebody give me the high sign. Go for it. Yes. Because I, I've been known to stop a little sentence. <laughs> and I can do it again. Okay. In 1830, in Mississippi Valley, west of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, from Canada to the Gulf, there were only 30 banks. Well, that's a switch, isn't it? In 1834, a banking mania seized the country, but by 1836, there were no banks of issue in Arkansas Territory. With removal, the need for a bank was great. There is evidence that Arkansas was admitted as a state in 1836 with only 47,000 free people in order to provide authority to create banks. See where the money is. The first legislature in 1836 created two the State Bank of Arkansas and the Real Estate Bank of Arkansas. It's always the land, folks. <laughs> Several months before he left his, the office of dispersing agent for Indian removal of the west of the Mississippi, Captain Jacob Brown served as president of the Arkansas State Bank. <laughs> There's Indian Affairs Mayor from the bank. Shortly after he left office as dispersing agent in 1837, he went to Washington, D.C., for C.A. Harris, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, promised to buy $300,000 in Arkansas bonds with money derived from the sale of Chickasaw or orphan lands in Mississippi. With the onset of the panic of 1837, land sales dropped, and only $146,000 was ultimately invested in the bank. The bank went belly up in 1843, in large part because officials of the bank loaned money to themselves and did not pay it back including Governor James S. Conway, partner in Glasgow and Harrison. <laughs> thus, uh, thus $146,000 of Chickasaw money went to poof. And it took the Chickasaws decades to retrieve it, and uh, I doubt seriously they got it all. The first Arkansas legislature in 1836 also created the real estate bank with branches throughout the state. One of the stockholders in the bank was Richard M. Johnson, Vice President, uh, former Vice President, Jacob Brown's replacement as dispersing agent for Indian removal of West Mississippi was Captain R. C. Collins. In November, following his taking the job in March, he became cashier of the bank. 
Notice how these officials in Indian Affairs are officials in the bank. So they're controlling the money even after it is supposedly uh, paid for removal. Collins used his public position to support his private affairs. It will be remembered that rumors were common that he was in collusion with Glasgow and Harrison. In 1838, he and his partners laid out the town of Decathlon, the north of where North Little Rock is now, and offered lots for sale. It was named for himself, Richard Decathlon Collins. One of the partners was Simeon Buckner. Got to have a the money. <laughs> Paul in 1839, Collins was elected to the board of the main bank in Little Rock. Later that year, he was elected president. In 1840, he was replaced. One of the directors at that time was Simeon Butler. <laughs> By the time Collins was apparently mixing removal money, apparently Chickasaw money, with bank funds, he was drinking heavily and making bad loans. At one time, as much as 200,000 of removal funds were, were missing, and Collins was contemplating suicide. When he died in 1841, some 215,000 missing. The real estate bank, this, this, the main bank marks of it, Wells Real Estate Bank went belly up, uh, primarily because its stockholders had borrowed that money too. Now there was a rumor around Little Rock at this time that Chickasaw Money had built the brick buildings in Little Rock. Now, among those who were indebted to the bank were C.A. Harris, John Drennan, and Lorenzo Clark. All familiar names. C.A. Harris had resigned as Commissioner of Indian Affairs on October 19, 1838. By early November, this is like less than a month, well, just only a few days in fact, he was one of the directors of the Real Estate Bank of Arkansas. He was in Little Rock. He also served as cashier at a salary of $3,500 a year, which is what he was making as Commissioner of Indian Affairs. It wasn't a lateral, I guess a lateral move. A year later, he was president of the Central Bank in Little Rock. In 1841, he was a director. In 1842, two months after Hitchcock filed his report, Harris died at Franklin, Tennessee. Thus, these banks resulted in the loss of an estimated $375,000, the lion's share of which was Chickasaw money. And what happened to the money is yet another episode in all the family. Still got time for that? All in the Family, Episode 3. We drop in on our little family again, and we find that Father Andrew's power and influence was strong but waning. The Whigs control, control, had control of Congress and were producing a little family of rogues and thieves themselves. They were a different kind of thieves, but thieves nevertheless. Cherokee removal took place as Jackson's power began to wane. The Cherokee overland contingents were held up in the Mississippi River in the winter of 1838 because ice created uh, danger for the ferry. So the story goes. That was true for a short time, but there was something else at work. The trouble really started at Nashville, uh, where the contingents lingered for some time. And I gave you a little bit of that long ago, but there was a lot of money spent by these Cherokee removal groups while they were in Nashville. And that was tantalizing, apparently, to the merchants of Nashville. And we know that there's evidence that they gouged the Cherokees, uh, sometimes discounting U.S. money, uh, which Ross's supply uh, uh, contingent uh, paymasters dispersing people carried with them. They actually had wagons that were called money wagons at the time. Um, now, they began to, uh, in Nashville, began to place doubt on the roads in Missouri. Uh, so that was one of the arguments they used to get people to uh, board the boats at Cape Girardeau. Ross's supply agents became 
concerned because of the time, by the time they reached the Mississippi, their funds had dwindled desperately low. Contingent leaders had become reluctant to move. Uh, Chulukey crossed the river with his contingent, but he had a rebellion on his hands on the part of Assistant Conductor James Walker and the Wagon Master. Ross's supply agents hadn't heard from him in two months. They had begun writing him desperate letters in Nashville and had even contemplated going back to the Cherokee Agency to see what had happened to him. By the time they reached the Mississippi, they were sending letters pleading for him uh, to join the land contingents in Illinois and give them some direction. Ross, who was aboard the Victoria, had been delayed by low water above Muscle Shoals. He caught up with his mail at Paducah and Cairo in January. What he read cost him to leave the Victoria Cairo and go to Willard's Ferry and Jonesboro, Illinois, where he directed the contingents to ignore stories about Missouri and to join and to, and the lack of supplies and ignore the arguments that they should avoid the, uh, avoid the land, take the uh, boats, and go the rest of the way by water. And of course, that would have been a disaster too if they'd done that because it was a drought, drought period and the waters in the west were notoriously low that year. So it wouldn't have been, uh, he had had the same trouble on the, on the Tennessee coming down uh, on those flat boats. Um, he guaranteed that the needs of the people would be met no matter what it cost. He took care of Chiwaluki's problem. Walford was relieved of his job the day Ross arrived on the scene, and Ross left orders for his agents to fire any employee who was recalcitrant, and they apparently let a number go. Uh, the attempt to convince the Cherokees to take to the steamboats at Cape Girardeau, for all evidence, seems to have been orchestrated to a large degree, but who could possibly have had anything to gain by having Cherokees take to the water? The best mode of removal had been debated in 1837 and 1838. Dr. Townsend, dispersing agent for the Cannon Convention, had argued for taking the Cherokees by water to Boonesboro, Missouri, and then over the Boonesboro to Springfield Road and on into the Cherokee Nation West. <coughs> Superintendent of Cherokee Removal, Nathaniel Smith, and Lieutenant Edward Bees, who had led Creek contingents both overland and by water, favored removal by water. By early 1838, in fact, Smith had a plan for removal in place. He had made a contract with Charles Matlock to transport Cherokees down to Tennessee to the foot of Muscle Shoals, and he had made a contract with Williamson Smith to carry them the rest of the way in contingents of 1,000 aboard the smelter. However, two things went wrong. The drought uh, deepened uh, beginning in May of 1838 and did not break until October. As the spring turned into summer, the water levels fell, and as you know, contingents like these first and Whiteleys had difficulty once they got they once they got into the Arkansas River and had to take make other arrangements as they went along. The Whiteley contingent also had a high mortality rate. These factors entered the Cherokee concern about the mode of uh, removal and added to their determination to remove themselves and go by land. Nathaniel Smith lost his job as superintendent of charity removal, but did he have anything to gain by trying to sabotage the Cherokee land removal? The truth may never be known, but we do know this. Williamson Smith was Nathaniel Smith's brother-in-law, and they were probably near blood relatives as well. Charles Matlock was also probably a relative because Matlocks were in an allied family of Smiths in East, East Tennessee. General Scott, shortly after his arrival to take over Cherokee removal in spring of 1838, received complaints that Smith had made sweet deals with his close relatives and friends. Shortly after he took the first bees contingent west in 1838, Williamson Smith filed a claim for all of the thousand who should have ridden his boat rather than the 250 who did. Sound familiar? Terry A. Harris, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, denied his appeal. Nathaniel Smith was from Athens, Tennessee. Did he have enough connections in Nashville to begin the rumor about Missouri roads and lack of subsistence supplies? Or was there another source? When Andrew Jackson learned of the agreement, John Ross had had reached with the government to allow the Cherokees to remove themselves 
He wrote Felix Grundy from the Hermitage, and this is a quote from Jackson. The contract with Ross must be arrested, or you may rely upon it. The expense and other evils will shape the popularity of the administration to its center. What madness and folly to have anything to do with Ross when the agent was proceeding well with the removal on principles of economy that would have saved at least 100% from what the contract with Ross will cost. The contract with Ross must be arrested and General Smith be left the superintendent of the removal, end quote. Now, which is the greater force at work here? Fiscal economy, dislike for Ross, saving Smith's job. That Jackson's cronies tried to help Williamson Smith collect his claim is certain. C.A. Harris had denied Smith's claim as Commissioner of Indian Affairs, but in October 1838, he left the Commissioner's office under the under fire for fiscal irresponsibility, and within a month, as you recall, he was in Little Rock as cashier in the Arkansas Little State Bank, which he helped to establish Chickasaw funds. Now, out of office, he argued that Smith should be paid for those charities who didn't try the votes. But was there any connection between the Smiths and Jackson? One of the many protestations about how much he admired the Cherokee people. Williamson Smith wrote to Felix Grundy, I have none but the kindest feelings for them, uh, doubly so on account of having seen many of them fight in the battles of our country during the war and lay many of our enemies low at the memorable battle of Horseshoe. I have lived their neighbor more ever since and know a great a body of them to be fine people and the battle of Horseshoe Bend. That watershed event for Andrew Jackson, the men who fought under him and with him in the War of 1812 were the pool from which he drew his heroes and friends whom he later favored with political plums. Look at the list of individuals involved in removal. William Armstrong, his brother Robert was Andrew Jackson's favorite in the battle of Horseshoe Bend. John R. Coffey, his brother-in-law, uh, Eppie-in-law. Uh, who negotiated the treaty. <coughs> William Carroll, treaty negotiating, negotiator and agent overseeing the Chickasaw land sales. Nathaniel Smith, more research, research on the Smith uh, family in Tennessee will tell us that. And with that, I'm stopping. <laughs> <laughs>